Okay, yeah, Pashak. Hey, uh, thanks. Uh, what are the sun angle viewing constraints? Uh, 90 degrees, so it's, it's pretty good. Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, David? Yeah, a couple of small questions. One is your point about um, the positional accuracy lending itself to IFU follow-up. I think it will work in some cases, but I mean, what about you know nearby galaxies or very dense regions of the Milky Way? Are there? I mean, I, I guess we're just then back in the same regime that you know other experiments were, so it's no, no worse. Is that sort of the logic? Um, so I'm I'm trying to figure. You, so you know, if you're looking at a very dense no region way. where it's not obvious what the optical counterpart is, you know, where there are you know 500 oh, so M stars. Oh, right, right. One arc minute box. Oh, no, no. My point is that if, if you have an IFU that has a one arc minute field of view, yeah. you throw the IFU down on top of the, um, the x ray position, and then uh, you'll see which pixel of the IFU shows up with the source. But what I'm saying is that in many cases, there will be a lot of sources in that box. And it oh, won't be obvious. Even exactly. even in the pixels within the IFU. So if you take like something like Muse as a one arc minute field of view with right. one second positions, right? So okay, yeah. maybe there, maybe I'm not understanding something. I just yeah, okay, right, no, so I, I agree. Mean, within a so pixel, I agree. Yeah, but I just don't know how you'll know which pixel to look at. Oh no! But if you have an integral field unit, you don't have to know which pixel to look at ahead of time, right? That's you, only if, only trait? if the only if the transient is obvious from the optical spectrum, which may not always be the case. Uh, okay, Th yeah, that, that that may be fair. I was thinking more for gamma ray bursts than for- Yeah, no, for gamma ray bursts, bursts, something like that, I agree. But, yeah. you know, if you're thinking like a, you know, um, something like in a, a nearby galaxy, like a, an eruption or something like that, yeah. especially if there's a time delay between the optical and the X-ray signals. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that, that may be fair, yeah. Um, but then you have time to do your photometry also. That's that's right. I, yeah, it was just. I don't think it's any worse. I just wanted to clarify that. And okay. the other point I wanted to make. I mean, yeah, you can do what Craig says, but you know, that's sort of back in the old game as well. Yeah, and I just also just wanted to point out, you know, another. Um, the timing for this might be slightly off, but I think in terms of the radio facilities, DSA two thousand, I yeah. think would have strong synergies. You, you're right. Yeah, that that's an excellent point. Um, you're involved with that, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and if you want to help us reach out to more of the DSA 2000 team and get them to realize that they also want Strobex, uh, in, that, that would be great too. Okay, uh, next is Adam Ingram. I was interested um, when you were talking about the wide field monitor uh, discovering new X-ray binary outbursts. Mm -hmm. And it made me think, how many more bright outbursts would we expect to detect? And, uh, you know, the flip side of that is how many are we missing with current wide, wild field, wide field monitors? <laughs> so we're going to go a factor of five or so deeper than current wide field monitors. And I guess the other issue with Maxi, uh, Maxi's angular resolution causes some problems in regions like the galactic center region uh, in terms of uh, you know, necessarily identifying it as a new uh, transient. So I don't, that's something I think we should work out the exact numbers for, and I don't have them off the top of my head. Um, but almost certainly if we start going a factor of five to 10 deeper, we're going to get a bunch of stuff. So is it, I mean, in terms of, I, I, I guess I'm thinking like, is it possible that over the last 10 years, we've missed some really bright uh, outbursts that would have been like really, really good. It's only like the dim ones that's right. I think it's more about like things like the very faint X-ray transients uh, and the yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Or we or we'd get on the bright outburst faster, maybe. Yeah, but if, right that also. But if you also think about things like XD eleven eighteen plus four eighty, uh, that's just barely detected by the wide field instruments, um, and it's at what is it one point two kiloparsecs. Uh, so there should be lots of black hole X-ray binaries that are, you know, at five to ten kiloparsecs that are like that object, and we're we're missing them. Yeah, uh, sure. But the, the things that get up to 10 to the 38, 10 to the 39, no, we, 
I think we only miss those if they're too close to the sun and the outburst ends before they get out from away from the sun. Okay, uh, DJ. Yeah, hi, Tom. Thanks for a nice overview. So I have a lot of science questions, but I guess the point of this meeting is not that it's to like, you know, refine science over the next couple of weeks, but I'm just going to ask a, a very broad question, which is like, okay. did I miss any response files slash background, like spectra kind of uh, files that you may have shared before? Because I think that is really going to be key in developing. Yeah. We, we have those from the 2018, 2019. Uh, and I think that's a good reminder to redistribute those. They're still available on the web page, Tom. You can anyone can download them. They probably need a revision yeah. now uh, after a couple of years, and I think there were some things we wanted to tweak. But for a zero authority thing, they're certainly good. Uh, I think all the instruments have a have a um, RF and an RMF. Okay. And another sort of like high level question is. You know, obviously making a connection to multi-messenger astronomy is going to be extremely important, especially with Lisa up and running. Uh, but you know, the first thing that comes to my mind is uh, these mergers or whatever Lisa is going to detect, it'll be out to much higher redshifts. So the question, the question is how sensitive um, will strobe X be to going out so far in redshift? Uh, so I think that is, Really, like you showed uh, the supermassive black hole uh, binaries merging and producing QPOs. But can you detect a QPO from a signal like that at a redshift of one, two? I, 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 it depends what fraction of Eddington it's at, right? So if, if it's really close to the Eddington limit, which a lot of the theory papers suggest it should be, uh, then I think we can, right? If, if the theory work is uh, overly optimistic and the things are highly sub Eddington, uh, then, then maybe with the XRCA, but it depends how sub Eddington it gets. Yeah, but there's two parts to that question. Like, right? first is detecting just the like the event, and two detecting the, the modulation. Yeah, which is, you know, it depends on the amplitude. It's it's yeah. a yeah. But if, if the modulation is like a factor of two, which a lot of the theory work again suggests is likely, um, then if you can detect it, you can detect the modulation. Oh, yeah. So it, it really depends how, whether the theory worker is overly optimistic or not, I think. So that's why we need the connection to the QP is to like sort of build a, a you know, science. Yeah, yeah, that's what the QP needs are, yeah. 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 Thanks. Okay. Uh, Craig? Thanks, Tom. That was great uh, coverage. Uh, I had a quick question about the um, the short GRBs trying to get spectra of those. Mm -hmm. One mission you didn't mention because obviously it's effective area is much smaller is Swift XRT, but it's but the question I have is how fast is it likely that we can get onto a GRB with strobe X? How, what's the reaction time? Uh, it's, so it, it'll it'll slew automatically at fifteen degrees per minute. So and and since the wide field monitor covers about a third of the sky. 10 minutes in kind of worst case where you detect it with Strobex itself. Um, but some of them will be much closer to on axis. Uh, okay. And the other thing to remember is, and, and this is something that we didn't work out in advance, uh, is the, the large area detector will have enormous collecting area compared to things like Fermi. Um, and so even though the background will be kind of high, the background is still not high compared to GRB fluxes. And so it may actually be that that 30 to 50 keV range where the, the large area detector has transparent collimators, but still good collecting area. Uh, that's something that we, we thought about in terms of magnetar detection uh, when we were doing the original case, but we haven't really thought about that carefully uh, in terms of what it'll do for normal GRBs. Um, but I think it'll actually really be revolutionary for normal GRBs. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, DJ, did you have another question or did you just forget to put your hand up? Oh, sorry, no, uh, no okay. thanks. All right, Rick. Yeah, you are you mentioned a 90 degree solar exclusion zone. Most yeah. missions, it's more like 30. And if it's 90, that's a huge hunk of the sky you can't go slew to and it might limit the studies. Is it really yeah. 90 degrees? And no. Yeah, did I have that right, Paul, or no? No, you, that's just that, that's the full width. It's, so it's, it's 45 degrees solar okay. exclusion. 
Okay. Um, so 45 degrees from the sun, which is the same as like what nicer has now. Um, if that's our plan. I mean, that's part of the sort of design studies is exactly where that happens, but uh, that's what it was in our ideal and MDL runs uh, back when we did the study it was 45 degree solar exclusion zone. And that was driven by what? Well, we have a, our biggest issue is thermal. There's a couple of different things, but thermal for the lad, uh, solar impingement on the wide field monitor um, because the uh, masks can uh, be warped or you know, they have temperature constraints on the masks. And just like nicer, you've got to, we're, we're light sensitive on the X-ray concentrator array. So there are uh, solar, you know, there's optical blocking filters and there's a uh, solar um, shields to try to keep sun off the mirrors and coming right down onto the detectors. So it's that kind of thing um, all put together. There's not one thing that says it has to be 45. So there's some flexibility in that a bit, but uh, it gets more challenging as you just have the larger range of, of thermal environments to deal with. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, uh, Aaron. Hi, thanks. Thanks for this great overview, Tom. I had a few questions, but I guess uh, the most pressing one from my perspective is, I guess, a strategic one. To what extent are the is the instrument designs fixed, and we're just like you know taking them and figuring figuring out what science can be done versus the instrument team taking feedback from the SWG, SWGs and, uh, and you know, yeah, and, and updating the designs. Yeah, to what extent is I'm that? I'm going to invite Paul and Colleen and whoever else from the hardware side who's on to chime in on this also. But I think we got a pretty good design lab run. Uh, and so we kind of know we can make this work within the budget constraints. And then it actually will work. And so I would say we don't want to do anything radical, but you know, small things like if we want to adjust the effective area for the two pointed instruments, or if we wanted to adjust the pattern for the cameras on the wide field instrument, those might make sense. Yeah, um, I would, we don't want to like add a new instrument or do something radically different because then we go into it with a, a much higher uncertainty on whether it'll work. But uh, right. one of the features of the probe call because it was recommended highly in the decadal and they want to start on it soon is that the time scale is pretty short. So there is a limited time for major design changes. I mean, the, the concept study that we will do will certainly have the ability to make design changes, you know, but as Tom says, really major things like totally changing the instrument suite and stuff would be hard to imagine. But yeah, I, I did I, want to emphasize that, um, there are a lot of design decisions still to be made at the, at the more detailed level. And, and Tom mentioned a lot of what we want the science working group to do as far as selling the mission to review panels and the rest of the community. But I think also important will be for the instrument teams that are trying to put together instruments, there will be decisions that are important that are on the level one requirements. You know, what do we need? How, how good do you need to be as far as collimating or excluding out of field sources, what fields of view do you need on these instruments? What is the sun angle constraint? You know, so if we have to make decisions uh, during the study, what if we have to cut the sun angle constraint down or up or change it? We wanna be able to go to the science working group and say, how does this affect your science? That's gonna be really critical that we have a really good flow down from the science we wanna to do to the instrument requirements that we build to. Yeah, and Colleen, do you wanna add anything to that or anybody else on the hardware side of things? Um, the main thought I main thing I wanted to add is that the instruments as we have them described right now are highly modular. So we do have some ability to change around the area without changing the design dramatically. Um, so I, Tom said something about swapping area between the, the two main instruments, um, the wide field monitor, we may have some a little bit of room to add or subtract cameras, um, that sort of thing. But yeah, big changes we got to watch out for because of TRL restrictions. Yeah. Did you have something more radical in mind, Aaron? Uh, well, I, I mean, I, I could certainly propose radical things, but no, that's not what I had in mind. Um, okay. I, what I had in mind were things like, you know, where the, what the energy ranges are, what the mask pattern is, um, th things like that, that I think um, are, are pretty technical and, and, you know, 
Yeah, and and I guess the question, like, it sounded like you were proposing that you know this, or I guess Paul was that you know the instrument teams would come and have these decisions that they make and pass them down to the science working groups, and then we, you know, people would put together what the effect would have. And I guess the question is, to what extent does it also go the other way? Like, how do we know which types of things you're willing to entertain? <laughs> um, stuff like that. We we definitely would like a two way conversation for sure, um, and you know starting i we spelled things out pretty clearly i think in the in the report for the that we submitted to the decadal so if there's anywhere in there where you'd like to push in one direction or another you know this is great but boy i wish that whatever changed a bit definitely say those and the earlier the better right because we can the earlier into the design process the more we can accommodate possible changes if there's something that looks important for your science that we're not quite there but you think maybe this could be accommodated then definitely say it. Thanks, guys. Yeah, and, and for the energy ranges, some of the numbers I gave are fuzzy because that's where things like, you know, the effective area starts to fall off. But if you have a really bright source, you could still do some stuff at higher energies. Um, for where the collimators become transparent, you know, Paul has an alternative collimator design that could uh, make the collimators work up to 50 keV, but that's lower TRL. Um, and maybe we, I, I think we probably, haven't appreciated how much of an advantage it is that the collimators become transparent at 30 keV. Yeah, I mean, like um, one, there's like one one like relevant question, right? You you put the you said that the uh, energy range of the w, WFM is goes out to 50 keV. And I guess the question is, is that of the detectors or is that by the transparency of the mass? Right? Is that an intrinsic sensitivity on the fall off the effective area, or is that for the convolution imaging? Things like details like that would be useful. Thanks, guys. Okay, so thanks, Aaron, um, the for the wide field monitor specifically, um, it's going to be based on the uh, loft wide field monitor, and there's SPIE papers that are describing it in quite a bit of detail, so you can get better answers to some of those questions. I don't know off the top of my head, but um, we can look into that. Yeah. Uh, hello, this is Marco speaking. Marco Feroci. Uh, I can give an answer to this question. The the quantum efficiency of the detectors is driving the effective area for the, the, the energy range for the WFM. And then the coder mask is done uh, accordingly, to the, accordingly to that. Thanks, Marco. OK, um, Jack? Yeah, uh, great catching up with this group again and um, excited about the, the month ahead. Um, I wanted to bring up what's sort of a, a I guess, been a, a pain point with nicer data that I think is relevant here, which is the, the uncertainty in the background. Um, and an idea that was discussed at some point was to either permanently fix or at least, or, or potentially have some um, ability to move a subset of detectors off of a point source to sort of get simultaneous particle background measurements um, that are by looking away from a particular target. Um, is that something that is still on the table, um, part of the design? And um, I, I wonder what thoughts about strategizing around that idea are in place, if anything sort of formalized. I'll, I'll say, if, if I can answer, that that is something that is still on the table as uh, hardware solutions to improve the background knowledge, background modeling capabilities. Um, we, back in the study, we had a working group of people that were interested in the calibration and background modeling issues. People forget who exactly was all on it, but Mike Novak and um, Kent Wood and various people. So I think we would like to reconstitute that and people that are thinking about those kinds of hardware issues. And if there are hardware solutions that would greatly improve the science by doing that, then yeah, we should definitely can consider them. I'm not sure what the right answer is as far as you know, offsetting detectors or things like that. That's it's those are non-obvious uh, choices to have to make. So we would like to be able to evaluate them and figure out what we can do in software, what we can do, um, you know, without having to make big hardware changes or or, or, or little hardware changes will do it. Because I know we've all been you know frustrated with some of the inscrutability and in figuring out the nicer background. Um, I, I have a thought about that, Paul. Um, how sharp are the concentrator response boundaries? They they get pretty steep. So in the nicer ones, you know, at about three and a half 
arc minutes off axis. They're very vertical. So they're, they're yeah. pretty flat top and then they cut down pretty fast. Right. Um, and then, they, then they have a tail that goes out a, if, a good bit further. If, so if you have that, you could do like stuff offset by half of the beam size. Uh, and so then if you cared a lot about the background, you could sacrifice half your effective area to get a, a background pointing. Uh, and if you didn't care about that because you had a really bright source and you weren't trying to find uh, really subtle features, then you could get the full effective area. Yeah, there are, yeah, there are possibles like that. And, and things like that then flow down into the difficulty of aligning everything and doing integration and test. And so uh, we just have to figure out what's what works well and what's doable. And we definitely need more people thinking about this. It's a super critical issue, I think. Thanks, guys. OK, so um, next, uh, Naveen. Yeah, thanks, Don. Um, so 15, uh, 15 degrees per minute is not really the fastest that one could uh, one would ideally want for uh, using for, for, for following up transient events. And after 10 years, when the future of SWIFT is a little uncertain, uh, are there any plans for reaching out to uh, LEGO Virgo collaboration? Because uh, they may sub, they may uh, they they may be able to uh, inform uh, the instrument teams about negative la latency uh, alerts uh, before the merger happens, one or two minutes before the merger happens. By looking at the templates, they should be able to uh, let let instrument teams know, uh, and that could perhaps offset the uh, time delay for slew uh, aaron has some comments uh, so yeah are there any plans of reaching out to lvc to get this done oh yeah we, we already have that in the science case actually okay. um great so yeah eric uh, burns who's i think on the call uh, helped a lot with working that issue out when we were having the design lab runs and we we definitely have some people who are in ligo virgo who are in strobex also uh, i think alessandra corsi isn't on here but uh, i know she is uh, i'm not sure who else but i know there are several people that are uh, in both teams. I'll see a message from Aaron. Sounds great. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no, that's a great idea. And that is something maybe we should think a little bit more about. Uh, Ricardo? Yes. Hi, everybody. Nice to meet you. Uh, apologies if you said that, but what's it going to be uh, about the observational strategy? Is there, uh, is it going to be a survey of the monitor interrupted by uh, follow-up or via priority targets, or is it going to be the uh, XRCA leading where the rest of the instruments are, are, are looking at? It, it's going to be mostly, you know, there'll be some core science that uh, gets locked in at the beginning of the mission, like, you know, measure the mass radius relation for X neutron stars and uh, whenever black hole transients go off, uh, uh, do a certain amount of time on them as targets for opportunity. And that kind of thing, but for the most part, it's going to be a PI program driven mission. Uh, and so the the wide field monitor all sky survey will just come for free as we gradually move around the sky right. doing uh, pointed observations. Um, somebody might propose to do staring with the wide field monitor if they had a really good reason for it, and I, I think we could certainly entertain that if if we get to that stage. But probably it'll be either the XRCA or the large area detector. That'll be the the driver of where we look, uh, and it'll be based on the ideas that come from the community. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, I told her. Oh, it's me actually, Emra. Oh, it's Emra. Hi, Emra. Hey. Uh, so my question is: so it has a very nice sort of, uh, possibility, but does does that mean that will there be a, a automatic uh, processing of images on board and, and automatic decision to go to the GRBs or exciting objects like the XTP WFM? Yeah. Is it the same idea? Yeah. Okay. And uh, my, I also would like to say about the, the background, I, it's really important. And also in the galactic reach region, the modeling might fail as well. So it, if there are some hardware solutions to be able to determine background, it would be fantastic. Thank you. Yeah. All right, uh, Bruce. Uh, so, as uh, can anybody hear me? Yeah. 
Okay, so as, as I said in the chat, um, uh, you can add an optical instrument for uh, just an incredibly tiny amount of uh, mass. And uh, I'm surprised that a trade study wasn't made for that. And uh, in, in the chat, somebody said, well, you know, there's lots of instruments that can slew to our targets after we you know, see something, but it only matters whether you're pointing when you see a transient for an incredible amount of uh, the science and the value out of things. So, uh, you know, at this point, uh, if you said, uh, you know, you can only have a kilogram or you can only have a half a kilogram, uh, I, I, I think that it, it, I, I would still propose something. Yeah, I think, Bruce, I think we, I think a lot of us like the idea that you pitched to us. Uh, there hasn't been any period to do any kind of trade study, uh, or at least where there was funding available between then and now. Uh, and uh, I think we have to think about whether we can do that kind of instrument without risking the success of the rest of the mission. But, and, and I think we also should think about, th this may be something that you could do with a, a very small satellite that just receives a signal from Strobex and it doesn't necessarily need to be attached to Strobex. Uh, uh, again, if it's not pointing in the same place at the same time, it loses all its value. So but if, I, if, you I, had, I, if you had another satellite, you could make sure that you had it pointing at the middle of the wide field instruments field of view uh, in between events that it wanted to stare at. Uh, okay, I mean, we can we, we can go over this, but I, 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 want, I just wonder if anybody considered an incredibly tiny, incredibly small mass allowance. So that's just my point. Sometimes these missions do have, you know, kind of educational options on them with student led instruments that are not brought to the level of level one requirements, but that are, you know, good to have, it would be nice to have, and you can, you know, sometimes accommodate those. It's, it's not, certainly not impossible. And I know that you wanted to get the multicolor optical photometry very early in the, the transient. So I, it's not, you know, that's something that could be considered, I think. Um, but yeah, if it can be done as a separate flying mission nowadays with, you know, inter-spacecraft links probably being a lot easier in the future, um, that would be something that you could just command a 3U CubeSat or whatever to do and follow along with what Strobex is doing. You know, it wouldn't be perfect, it wouldn't be in the same orbit, but maybe 60% of the time you'd be able to do it or something like that. Or, or you could throw three of them up there because it would be cheap and right. yeah. There's student, student collaboration. Uh, there's also a science enhancement option. So that might be something to think about as well. Um, you can you know, propose that as a separate part of the proposal. Okay, there's a bunch more stuff in the chat and I'm gonna suggest, for those of you who don't know, we have a Slack group. Um, uh, it, it, if there's anyone who needs the link to the Slack, uh, send me an email after the call and I'll uh, invite you to the Slack. But I think this is probably something that would be better further discussed in the Slack than on the call, uh, especially because there's a lot of stuff flying through on the chat already. Uh, all right, Alex. Oh uh, yeah, so I just had a question um, in regards to like, using uh, Strobex for doing kind of the multi-wavelength spectral timing of X-ray binaries. So compared to like nicer when you get like the short sort of snapshots, are we gonna be able to get like longer uninterrupted um, observations? Cause like we've been talking about those snort, those short um, nicer snapshots kind of make it not so great for doing the multi-wavelength correlations and stuff. So I'm wondering what it's gonna be like. So, so is low earth orbit, so the earth occultations are just gonna happen. Okay. Um, NICER has some extra problems from the space station itself blocking the uh, telescopes sometimes, and we shouldn't have those problems, so it'll be a little bit better. Uh, and it also shouldn't be too hard if you have a good reason to get four or five Strobex orbits back to back. Uh, okay. It flew fast enough that it won't waste its time staring at the Earth and it'll jump off to something else in between, uh, but you should be able to jump back to your source uh, when it comes out from behind the Earth again. Yeah, Thanks. Think, think the duty cycle that we saw with XTE, you know, you can sit on a source if you need to continuously, except for when it's behind the earth. And that, that's a lot better than what NICER gets with its very short snapshots. Like I said, the ISS constraints can make it quite difficult for, for NICER. Uh, we wouldn't have that, but we won't be in a three day orbit where we can be, you know, camp on something continuous viewing for a long time, unless it's at a particular orbital latitude. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah, that's a particularly bad engineering problem to put 5,000 kilograms in a three-day orbit. Colleen, you wanted to say something? Yeah, uh, the thing I wanted to add was that uh, depending on the brightness of the source you're monitoring, um, if the wide field monitor can detect it, it's going to have a uh, good time resolution as well. So um, it, you can get kind of for free observations in addition to the pointed ones. Yeah, that's a really good point. Thanks, Colleen. Awesome, thanks. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're coming up on the hour and there are no hands up anymore. Um, so, oh wait, no, no, Bruce is back up, yeah. Uh, so how hard is it with your orbit and CVZ to, uh, to try and cover another instrument? And so just in the briefest, uh, just stupid idea, uh, how hard would it be to say that you covered uh, Chimes field of view for you know, X percent for six months? It's an interesting question. What is Chimes field of view? It's about 200 square degrees. Yeah, I worked out yeah. on this question, Bruce, for uh, for Swift. The problem with Leo, right, is that Chime is a is a trans is a transit survey telescope, and so they, you know, when you're above North America, then you can cover their field of view very well, um, and when you're not, you can't do it at all. But if you want to bias your schedule, then yeah, you could maybe do it, you know, uh, uh, up to a third of the time, um, but that would that would basically require biasing your schedule to look at the GI targets that you want to look at when they are uh, temporally above the, the local zenith of uh, Pendicted British Columbia, which is possible. R um, uh, sorry, uh, who's talking and can you uh, message me or email me or something that section? Okay. That was uh, Aaron Tohuvavahu. Okay. Thank you, Aaron. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Um, and you can see where I'm going with this in regards to, you know, FRBs and so on. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think the 200 square degrees is relatively similar in size, but there may also be an issue with the wide field monitors layout not matching the chime shape, because the chime is a north-south beam that's pretty narrow, right? That's right. Yeah, so probably you could get half of the chime beam a third of the time or something like that if you wanted it. Or... Yeah, what, what's useful about this question actually is that because the chime... Uh longitude is the same as LIGO Hanford. If you do this, you also bias your field of view coverage to that of the gravitational wave antenna lobes, which is a, another interesting thing to consider. Okay. All right, uh, anybody have anything last minute and urgent? Uh, if not, this has been a great discussion uh, and hopefully we get some uh, further discussion going on in the Slack. Um, and uh, I'm gonna to aim to get something set up for two weeks from now and uh, I'll let everybody know in the next couple of days uh, once I have that sorted out. Okay. Thanks a lot, Tom. This was great to see everybody. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tom, for organizing. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you, bye. Thank Thanks. you, everyone. You Thank you. Thanks again. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.